Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. Well, good afternoon. We hope you enjoyed uh, Dr. Damon's presentation this morning. I mean, this early, earlier this afternoon, I should say. Uh, before we begin our presentation today with our uh, alumni panel, we'd like to have a few comments uh, from one of the leaders of our Tepper School Alumni Board, Paul Wellner from the class of 86 at Deloitte Consulting. We're going to talk a little bit, following up on what the Dean talked about in terms of areas of involvement for alumni. He's going to talk about some special initiatives with the Alumni Board. So join me in welcoming Paul Wellner. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right, good. I'm not going to use the microphone then. Thanks, John. Uh, and again, Paul Weller, class of 1986, some of my colleagues uh, from 86 on the panel, as well as in the, uh, the audience. And we had a big group last night, I think 26 of us, so combined with the, uh, the class of 81 for a nice, uh, nice event down at, uh, at the Rivers Club. And uh, uh, the, uh, one of our alums, Bart O'Brien from the class of 81, uh, who's got a winery in Napa Valley, was nice enough to host uh, the event for us last night. So we had a, we had a great time. We look forward to you know, meeting many of you here at the, uh, at the dinner this evening. But uh, what I really wanted to talk about uh, real quickly today was an initiative that got kicked off uh, three, just going on three years ago, started in 2008. Uh, we put in place what's called the Dean's Alumni Advisory Board. Uh, currently, we've got 13 members. Uh, with four newly appointed members that will be effective uh, July 1st to bring us to, uh, to 17 members. And we're really a, a diverse group uh, cut across classes. So we go from you know, 76, 86, 96. We've got uh, even uh, joining us uh, you know, a new member of the graduating class. So we've got a range of, range of folks who are involved from a class standpoint. We've also got a range of folks from a geographic standpoint. We have members, members from Hong Kong, uh, members from various different places in the U.S. looking to continue to expand geographically as well into Europe, you know, and, uh, and some of the other uh, other continents as it makes sense. We've also got pretty good diversity from an industry standpoint. We've got consultants, we've got bankers, we've got people who work for uh, fo places like Amazon. Uh, we've got a range of folks that are in different places in their career as well. So it's a pretty good, you know, diverse panel, and we're really trying to be a working group as well to really take some of the needs that we see in our discussions with the dean and with John and others, and kind of bring those into a working group to where, where we can actually start to make some progress uh, on some of the things that the dean talked about, frankly, at the uh, at the very end of his presentation. How do we get better connected as alumni communities and those? Frankly, those alumni communities can take a number of different dimensions. There's class-oriented dimensions, so you know we've we've really done some things around reunion years to try to you know kind of connect people more effectively from a from a class standpoint. We're also trying to do things in different cities to connect people kind of in geographic areas, you know, across classes. And we're also trying to come up with other ways that might be, you know be effective ways to connect. Uh, some of it is you know kind of in-person, face-to-face type connection. Did I do that? Your, time, your time's up. Oh, yeah, really. That's the hook. <laughs> and, and some of it, frankly, is using electronic means. So we're experimenting with class Facebook pages. We're experimenting with LinkedIn. We're experimenting with some other things to try to stay stay connected. You know, kind of using some of the third-party tools that are out there, as well as uh, some of the, the tools that are available from a university standpoint. So we're doing a lot of different things to try to uh, try to uh, connect. Uh, you know, ourselves with, with each of you in a lot of different fashions. So we're also, I would love to show you a picture of our group, which is actually the next slide, but we're not going to be able to see that. <laughs> but you'll see that there also are a lot of different opportunities to get involved. Yes. Uh, come talk to one of us who are here uh, over the next uh, day or so. I think there's five of, our, our, of, our of my colleagues on the board that are here for reunions. Uh, we've got, uh, let's see. Larry White, who's class of 76, uh, Lauren McCullough, who's uh, class of 86 with myself, uh, and then Remo Jolly and PJ Juvacar, who are both uh, class of uh, 96 who are here. So connect with one of us uh, you know, this evening, or just connect with John when, when uh, there's an activity that's, uh, or an opportunity to get things together in your city, or you know, shoot us an email with, uh, you know, with ideas. We're really looking to try to you know, build uh, 
a tighter alumni community, a more effective alumni community, again, whether it's across geographic or industry or class dimensions. So love to have your help. Uh, there's lots of different ways to get involved. Again, talk to John, talk to one of us, and we'll be glad to kind of you know harness some of your horsepower to get some things done in the organization. So thanks. Thank you so much, Paul. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, as you heard the Dean speak today, he talked about the intellectual capital at the school and, and the outstanding faculty that, that we have at the Tepper School. And that's really been one of the historic strengths of the school as you look back to our Nobel laureates uh, on to our current faculty. We'll today I have the joy of being able to introduce uh, one of our faculty members who's one of the treasures here on the, uh, on the Tepper staff. She, uh, <coughs> is the Carnegie Bosch Professor of Organizational Behavior and Theory here at the school. She holds a BS from the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, an industrial psychology and an MS and a PhD in organizational behavior from the Kellogg School of Management uh, at Northwestern University. She began teaching here in 1989, and her research focuses on a variety of areas. When we normally invite her to, to talk or speak, it's usually on interdisciplinary teams, conflict, innovation, negotiations, uh, she also works very much in, with our entrepreneurship students here at the school. One of the alums was saying, how can we have so few entrepreneurship professors? And I said, well, it's really because entrepreneurship is kind of in the DNA of the school. It's, uh, it's in the blood of our students and our faculty. So many of our faculty or in the other disciplines also speak about that important area of entrepreneurship. And as Lori will share with you today, she's very uh, much a part of that as well. So she's published numerous articles in organizational behavior, social psychology, and organizational psychology. She currently serves as the president of the Interdisciplinary Network for Group Research and has been one of our faculty leaders for the curriculum review at the Tepper School. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce you, the moderator of our panel today. Join me in welcoming Dr. Lori Weingart. Well, it's great to be here. It's great to see you all. I recognize a few faces. Um, I've been here for over 20 years. So at this point, I guess, John, to take the year of graduation off the bio. <laughs> okay. uh, so it, it's wonderful to be able to moderate a leadership panel here at our analytical school because we all know what an important role leadership plays in career trajectories. And we try really hard to develop leaders as they graduate from GSIA and the Tepper School. And I was here when it was GSIA. Okay. I still call it that. Um, <laughs> That's my first thing that pops to mind. So we're very lucky to have a set of alum with us, esteemed alum across the years, to talk about this issue and how they've developed in their careers. And so what I'll do first is just introduce the panel and get an opening question going. I'm going to let them talk. Hopefully they'll give each other a little bit of uh, room to talk as well. And then we have many questions. We'll also open it up to questions from the floor. So let's start with Dean Kapoor right here. He graduated in 1976 with an MSIA. Uh, many of you know he's the president of Navistar International Truck Group since 2003. Uh, before that, he was an executive with Ford Motor Company from 1976 to 2003, and that's actually when we first met, when he opened his doors to us to come in and do research, and it really started my work on interdisciplinary teams, so I thank you for that. Uh, he's also been a corporate sponsor of a course on, in, in uh, TEPRA that's actually a Carnegie Mellon course, course called the um, Integrated Product Development course, and it brings students in from engineering, design, and the Tucker School. So thank you for joining us. Uh, Ajit Chetty is also from the class of 76. He's Corporate Vice President, Worldwide Operations for Johnson & Johnson, and a member of the Corporate Group Operating Committee. He also serves as Chairman and Managing Director of Janssen Pharmaceutical in Belgium. Uh, next we have Jim Foss. I guess you guys are not seeing the order I have. So Dom, there we go. That's my name. <laughs> okay, so that's two over, right? Okay, so then one over, we have Jim Foster from the class of 86, uh, managing director of Great Court and Company. So his career included includes institutional investment management and consulting roles with Schroeder Investment Management North America in New York, Mellon Financial Corporation, and J.P. Morgan. Uh, then next we have Daniel, who's at the end, Daniel Lenido. He's a partner at Deloitte & Touche. He leads strategy and operations consulting practice for Mexico. 
and is also the middle market private company initiative leader for the overall firm in the American continent. And then finally, we have, not, not least, but last, we have Jose Trader. So he graduated in 2006 with an MBA. Uh, he's vice president of Bank of America Securities <coughs> LLC, uh, uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch. So join me in welcoming our panel. Thank you. So the topic of this panel is focusing on leadership across the decades. Uh, and so we have a nice broad representation. So I thought we'd open and just give each, pa each panelist look, just a short amount of time to talk about how they think about themselves as a leader. So what type of leader they are and what leadership skills they think are most important to their success. And then we'll have open it up to more generational questions. So maybe we'll start at the end with Daniel. Thank you. So the, the microphones are live, yeah. <clears throat> so good morning, good, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, Professor. Um, basically, the way that I would describe at least what I've seen in my generation is that leadership, or at least the way that I, that I would describe the kind of leadership that I try to exert, is a participative leadership. <clears throat> is this on? Yes? Maybe it's not. The other mic. OK. Uh, and by participative, I mean that uh, whereas the way that we thought before that leadership was executed when you know, it came basically from the helm and everybody could listen, uh, I believe the main difference that, uh, that at least I see in, in the people of my generation, the way that I, I see it in uh, the own organization where I, where, I, where I am, is that you need to be able to bring more people into the leadership. Uh, process, if you can call it a process. And by that I mean that uh, uh, it's very consultative, you know, that uh, uh, it's basically getting a lot of consensus from your teams, from the people that report to you, from the people also that, that you report to, uh, because it is not because you want to spread, you know, the, uh, the guilt or spread the blame, but it's more about being able to gain, uh, uh, you know, consensus support for things, because basically what you see is that in the past, uh, you really had no resistance, at least this is what I at least educated to see. But in the past, basically everybody obeyed. Now at this point, everybody would say yes, but maybe they would not do things. So, so you face a lot of uh, passive resistance. And if you do not go into a participative way of leading teams, then your chances of being able to gain the support you need to really execute things and to uh, achieve the objectives that you're set to achieve, then, uh, the, 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 the chances of that will be very, very low. So participation is, uh, at least I think, a key aspect of, uh, of leadership on, on the people from, uh, say, the generation of the uh, ex gens no? such as me. Uh, that is, I believe, the way that I would describe it. Thank you. <coughs> Yeah, thanks for uh, having me here today. Um, obviously, don't have as, as much experience as the rest of the team here, but uh, you know the way I view leadership um, at my role is uh, you know I, I'm not in charge of a full company or a full division. I focus on you know driven, driving the process of whatever you know deal we're working on from start to finish. So I, I've got to be a leader, not only for the process itself, and there are some people who report to me, associates, analysts, who I'm, um, you know, I guess, senior, senior to them, and therefore I have some sort of authority and can guide them that way. You know, but the, the real trick is that, you know, in every day when I go in, we've got a process that we've got to deliver to the client, or, you know, a task that we need to accomplish. I need to be a leader, not only down, but up to, Whoever I'm talking to, and a lot of times when I go with our clients, it'll be a CFO, CEO. So therefore, I, I really don't have any authoritative leadership over them. What I try to do myself is really outline a process that makes sense, communicate it clearly to the clients, and you know, learn, earn their trust. And that way, whenever I you know go to the meetings with them, you know they they understand that hey, this 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 you know this gentleman's coming in. He's outlining a thought process and communicate very clearly as to the importance of why they need to you know, spend time on my project, give me time to you know, help them accomplish what they need as opposed to being pulled in other directions. 
Having said that, you know, I'm also not doing everything in the project. I've got, you know, associates who help me out. You know, those guys are usually straight out of high, I mean, straight out of college or, or more junior. And to that sense, you know, they're, for them, I really need to outline a clear path of what needs to be accomplished and work with them and give them flexibility when needed. But the communication is 100% the most important part. And then, you know, your constant feedback. So if, so if an, an analyst has trouble um, with a certain task, you know, you need to be there to help them out, yet give them enough flexibility to try to, you know, accomplish things on their own. Okay. So there's, all right, that's enough. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, yeah. Uh, I think each one of us is a function of our background and the environment we work in. And I tended to work in a highly unstructured research environment and, uh, Dr. Paul Jansen, which is probably one of the most productive research labs. So it's really um, been a very, very participative and without going into too much detail, very people oriented because you were talking with a lot of experts who are literally world champions in each of their areas of expertise. So how do you bring this group of people together? And I think it's also a function of the situation you're in because I think it's one kind of leadership that's needed to develop a new product for cancer. And it's another kind of leadership which is needed to build a new factory in Fort Washington, Pennsylvania. So I think you've really got to be able to span that kind of spectrum from developing a highly unstructured solution to developing a very, very structured and defined solution. I think the key thing in any leadership I found during the years, and I'm you know, one of the, shall we say, the grandfather of the group here, has been you're really a function of the team you, you pick, uh, the experts, because you're only as strong as the team, and how do you ensure that in that team you build the culture of collaboration. Because at the end of the day, no one has a monopoly on intelligence, insight, or, or, or genius. It's the team that really finds the entire result. And as a leader, you've got to be prepared to take the final decision and everything that goes with it. It's the responsibility and the accountability. And when things go wrong, you've got to be able to stand up and say, you know, I'm responsible and I, I'm responsible for this mistake. That's extremely important. The second thing I think that's extremely important for the team, you know, to energize them and motivate us to clearly define what's the end state that one is working towards. And that should be compelling enough that it not only advances the, the values of the, of the company, but it also helps them to deploy their potential to the fullest extent. extent. And I think that's extremely important. And being able to communicate in a very concise and clear fashion. And I think the third but not the last, uh, and I'm sure I've missed out a lot, but is to keep within the time limits is, I think, managing the expectations of your stakeholders. It sounds very trite to say, you know, you under-promise and over-deliver, but at the end of the day, you've got stakeholders, whether they're customers, whether they're employees, whether they're the community you live in, and finally, not, not, not least, but and certainly not the last, is the stockholder. How do you manage those expectations and do it in an effective way, balancing the, the conflicting interests of the different groups? Thank you. When I think about leadership, I actually go back and think about when I've been a follower. Uh, because you can't be a leader unless people are following you. Otherwise, you're simply an individual employee. Uh, and I've been a follower in complex environments, simple environments. Uh, I've been a follower in successful companies. I've been a participant in turnarounds. And in each of those circumstances, the people that have been effective leaders that I've seen, and certainly what I've strived to do, uh, there's a, a, a full credibility there that's a function of both expertise and trust. Uh, there's an intellectual and rigor in thinking and framing problems. There's also a genuine empathy and understanding for the people that are there. And, and importantly, an understanding of the political environments in which people work, because uh, you can't always choose your team, and people have goals that may differ from the firm or the organization, and if you're not aware of the things that drive and motivate and reward, it's very difficult to persuade and then lead. Uh, the, the one thing that I would point to, though, in my experience, uh, that I have found very consistent across uh, environments is that a, a leader who is dishonest, uh, basically a leader who is deceitful or subtle, or just an outright scumbag, uh, can be quite effective for some period of time. Uh, but what really happens is the character of a leader ultimately permeates their organization. 
And the responsibility of leadership actually goes well beyond competitive success. Uh, when you think about the role you have, if you lead with integrity, you actually help people to behave in ways that they're proud of. Doesn't mean you win necessarily, doesn't mean you get everything out of them, it doesn't mean you do a spectacular job, but you enable them to be the kinds of people that their families would be proud of. When you don't lead with integrity, in fact, the responsibility is quite awesome because you do, in fact, lead people to behaviors that if they did them in their own families or if they did them in their churches or their faith communities, they'd be ostracized. Uh, so for me, successful leadership has to start with a, a clear sense of character, value, respect for the people you're working with, and a genuine commitment to them individually and to their families that you will help them to be good people and to do good work. Well, uh, these guys have taken all my answers, so this will be brief. Um, I think, you know, I jotted out a couple of thoughts here about leadership, the way I've seen it play out over, over the decades and and like Ajit says, we're, we're the seasoned, well-matured, and old casts without light and all that stuff. Um, but uh, you've got to start by paying your dues. You've got, you've got to have um, the humility and the integrity and the hard work that people were, will respect you and listen to you, and you, you'll have a reputation that will allow you to lead. That's kind of first and foremost. Um, you, you've got to be multi-dimensional. You know, more and more, I, I, I find, at least in the business that you know I've grown up in, which is you know complex manufacturing, you've got to you've got to have um, your finger on the pulse, obviously, of you know the products and the technology and the shareholders and all that. But you've got to have a relationship with legislators, with you know uh, constituents, groups, um, and you've got to be able to influence them. Uh, to some extent, and, and be able to talk their language when, re when required. Um, I think uh, the other thing I would say is, while you're doing all this, you can't play it safe. You cannot play it safe in this day and age. Um, I would argue a lot of what's happened over the last two or three years you know, General Motors going bankrupt, and you know Chrysler going bankrupt, and what happened to the banks and financial institutions is a consequence of playing it safe or having not paid your dues. Um, and so, it's always risky, you know, when, when you when you take a, a bold step. But more and more in this day and age, in this in this competitive environment. If you don't distinguish yourself, you don't have some originality in some fashion, you're probably going to lose over the long run. Thanks. So a second, I guess, follow-up question is I listen to all the answers focusing on managing tasks, managing people, managing with integrity, uh, t teamwork and collaboration. I'm wondering if you reflect back on your careers how your view of leadership changed over the years as you progressed through your own career. So being more on the entry level, middle manager, to managing large organizations. So if anyone want to take that one. Yeah, I, I mean, again, it's all based on personal experience because, you know, I started off pretty much as an individual in a back room. And you're really, you, know, you try to prove yourself through technical skills. Uh, but as you get more and more responsibility and as you get a few gray hairs, you start being responsible for a project, and um, when you start developing responsibility for a project, you're beginning to achieve things through other people, so it's not simply yourself, so you're beginning now to become a little bit more adept at managing the softer skills, apart from just the regression analysis. And then as you get further down the, the, the you know, in, the, in terms of managing people, it's about you begin to start managing your, your, your clients, you start managing bigger groups of people, so you start thinking about how do I develop these people to be able to take a much more expanded function. And I think today what you're really being looked at is how you, you know, leading the business and how you, you know, developing the strategic initiatives that are going to make a difference for the company, the people, and all the different constituents tomorrow. Yeah. <clears throat>
<clears throat> so um, I guess the way the way that I that I it's very complementary of what you just said. Uh, you go out of Carnegie Mellon, you are a technical. You feel like a technical authority, not, not that you are a technical authority. You feel like one, which might not be true. Uh, and then you go out into the world. That basically, the way that you begin to exert leadership, at least again in my experience, is that you begin by trying to uh, propose a technical authority, that technical leadership in the different teams you, you you work. And I believe this is true not only for consulting, which is where I where I am, but uh, in also pretty much all other sorts of professions. And as you begin to uh, to, to to grow within uh, within within your career, your work, uh, a transformation begins to occur in the sense that technical begins to become more uh, human. So so you, you you start to stray away from the technical part of, of leadership, <coughs> try to go into the human side of leadership, which is ever more challenging than anything that you can imagine in books or that you can read in books, no? Uh, and the reason for this is that uh, basically you try, you, you need to try to uh, concentrate all the technical authority that you believe you have and that eventually you get to have into mentoring people, into into being like a, like a like a sort of a of a of a professor and they being an apprentice, no? So that they can learn from you and that you can begin replicating that good you have of yourself into every person that you meet that will work for you or will work with you, so they can basically uh, emulate that sort of values, the sort of, uh, of, uh, of, of ways of approaching uh, problems, the ways of approaching work, etc., so that they can eventually be, um, I'm missing the word in English, but that they basically can, can continue <coughs> the, uh, uh, the, the, the path that you learn from somebody who was also on that sort of way. So, the way I see, I see leadership evolution is it's something like a curve that at some point reaches a plateau and then you begin to do something again and you reach some people who are at the bottom of that curve and they try to replicate it again. So, so you begin with technical, you move with human, and then I am beginning to see, not, not particularly in my organization, but on the organizations we serve, is that then the human authority evolves to political authority, even in large corporations or even in pure capitalistic corporations, no? <coughs> where politics should not play a game, oh, they play it a lot of time. And, and that's the way that you also need to begin to be sensible to be able to begin navigating the, the, the waters ahead, no? Yeah, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm, I feel like I'm, since I'm only out five years, you know, when I, do, when I came out of, of Tebra, I felt like I had a skill set which allowed me to be very analytical and you know, drive the process to, for a specific thing, right? Um, as I've moved up at the bank, you know, I've developed more skills, understand the bigger picture, you, you kind of remove yourself from the absolute day-to-day -day task and you go up one level. And at that point, you, you have to remember what you did, how you did it, the difficulties that you found when you were learning everything how you know your your mentor at that point taught you how to do it and then you when you move up one level up there's someone that's at that level coming in who's having the same issues. So for me, you know, I took my experience and I try to use that to coach and teach and make, you know, my 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 prior experience, you know, a, a tool for them to use and then bring them up at the same time, you know, that allows me to look further beyond because I'm not tied up in the little details and I'm able to expand my reach beyond my immediate scope. So uh, a couple of thoughts on, on this. Um, I think as you mature and grow up in the, in the real world, uh, this is where your basic value system and the stuff you learn in school, including uh, at uh, Carnegie Mellon, really comes to the fore. Because uh, how good you are in um, visioning things, how, how forward focused you are, how solution oriented you are, and then you know, how well you develop relationships and, and as you progress, the people judgment side becomes more and more important. And as Jim you know, mentioned, you find some scumbags out there who will be you know, able to get ahead in the short term and, and you'll have to deal with that. So, all of this kind of complexity becomes um, part of your skill set. 
dealing with it as, as you mature. And you know, the higher you go, you, you got to now deal with things like um, you know, trade deficits, trade policies, taxation policies, you know, uh, government incentives. Uh, are you creating jobs or not? You know, when you go and talk to politicians, these, this is the vernacular you have to be able to talk in. And therefore, you have to think about it in, in your business as you go along if you want to be fluent in it. So it, it's kind of a, an evolving thing, a growing thing. The higher level dimensions start to move in. The softer stuff starts to move in. The people's stuff really starts to move in. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, that's that's a good point. When I think back, one of the one of the sayings that uh, stuck with me that my father would always say to me was, "There's no issue cut so thin that it doesn't still have at least two sides." Uh, and he would usually tell me that when I was arguing with my mother, uh, and I was clearly convinced that there was only one position, and I had it, and I was right. Um, so I, I think my leadership skills over time, uh, how have they evolved? I, I think. What's interesting is my own personal conviction about my skill sets has diminished over time. I feel less confident that I actually know what I'm doing. Uh, having said that, the breadth of experience allows me then to be a much better leader because I, I am able to help organize, and most of my leadership environments have been fairly complex problems and dynamic environments, although I did uh, lead one turnaround that was fairly block and tackle. But you know, th that kind of diminishing of my own confidence has actually made it much easier for me to help th the people on a team or in a group kind of organize and summarize data and situations without any bias. Uh, you know, it's helped me to really build a framework for investigating the issues with people. I still obviously have a view, the leader is in front uh, and therefore accountable. But I think my, my ability to really uh, work with people well, uh, to see them as genuine contributors and to be eager uh, to listen to them and to elicit their ideas, uh, that really has evolved over time and made me much more effective uh, in the way I lead teams. Okay. Yeah. I just like to add you know, to what you said, Jim, because I think one of the things which was implicit you know, about as you get you know, build up the expertise with the people around you, I think is going to be the trust and the high level of trust and, and responsibility, you know, that goes hand in hand. And that I think is extremely important in this, you know, as you evolve in the scale of doing things and getting things done. So maybe you could share with us a few, some stories about some leadership challenges you faced and what you learned from those experiences. <laughs> well, I'll give you one. I, uh, I went into a turnaround where the, um, the company's basic assets had fallen from 50 billion to 20 billion. Uh, they had fired a third of the workforce, uh, moved most of the operations out of the states, and I came in to rebuild this. Uh, and the first day I met with people, I said, you know, look, uh, I don't know you that well, but I bet roughly there's a third of you who absolutely could represent us well in the world going forward but you so thoroughly hate this organization that you can't, and you need to leave now, and we'll arrange for that to work well. Uh, I said, there's probably another third of you who absolutely are equipped to represent us with passion and confidence, uh, but you lack the skills uh, that we need because this is fundamentally a new business going forward. And I said, and you all need to self-identify, and you need to leave now, and you know, we will make that work for you well, and you need to come to me and self-identify because if you wait too long, uh, we won't release you well. And then I said, there's a third of you who probably you know, really do have the skill sets we need, you're passionate about the place, and we'll embrace you and we will stay and uh, work and move forward. And interestingly, you know, people came up to me after that meeting and then subsequently they did self-identify. They were honest, we completely uh, re uh, uh, jiggered the nature of the employees and so forth. And we did, in fact, honor the promises. We found people jobs, we gave good severance packages, those kinds of things. And, and the result of just being direct and honest and, and bringing out for people what they really thought and felt uh, allowed them to behave in ways that was constructive for everyone. 
So that was one instance that I thought was, uh, was fairly uh, useful and indicative of what I thought had experienced before people exercising good leadership. Yeah, um, I've got to be careful how I de de describe it. Yeah, it's a situation where we felt that uh, a particular operation had eroded over the years, and it's like you know, family with ten children. One is extremely delinquent, mm -hmm. and that particularly spreads across the entire family, and everybody paints the family with the same brush. And that delinquency hadn't developed overnight. It was an erosion of values. You talked about values, which developed over years, and it just goes on and on. The multiple factors, lack of visible leadership, the inability to bring up issues right from the factory floor to the supervisors and the management. So everything got squelched, and you know it just went from bad to worse. And how to deal with that situation is an extremely challenging because it's pretty much an iconic facility and how do we deal with it and change the culture in the process with all the trauma of laying off people, how do you rebuild confidence, and how do you suddenly recreate a culture where it's okay to make a point of view, even though it might not be what your boss or your leader might like to hear, but being very, very explicit and ensuring that whatever you're saying is in the best interest of the corporation. So extremely challenging, a lot of moving parts, but hopefully, you know, since we're in the midst of it, we'll get around it in a due course of time. Well, uh, we're kind of in the middle of one right now. Um, I don't know how many of you, you know, are familiar with this, but with, with uh, stricter emission standards for motor vehicles and um, you know, especially diesel engines, of which we are a very large manufacturer, uh, a couple of Diverging technologies came to the fore. You know, one championed by almost everybody on the globe, especially the Europeans who kind of pioneered this going back 10 years. Uh, and they all elected a certain path. You know, it was called SCR, Selective Catalytic Reduction. And um, Daimler, the, the largest commercial vehicle manufacturer in the world, Volvo, the second largest. Um, Cummins, you, know, you, you name it, oh, MAN, Japanese, so on. And we stepped back and we said, well, we have, we've got the same challenge, but here's an opportunity for us, getting back to an earlier point, how can you play it safe, and go with the flow, or to distinguish yourself, and you take that risk. And so we took a risk. We said we're going to choose a different path. We're going to not go with this technology that requires the use of after treatment and additives and all that sort of stuff. We're going to go with one that doesn't require. Well, we're in a, we're in a food fight right now with them. Uh, and, and frankly, even, even with the Environmental Protection Agency on you know, what, what constitutes the right way to, to evaluate uh, performance. So, we're in the middle of this. Uh, this will unfold over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, if I'm not here a few years from now, you'll go on a Thanks. Uh, I guess uh, a good example also has, thank you. A, a good example is about the, uh, the intertwining of uh, leadership with vision, with accountability, no? So, so I guess that, that, that also to, to to be able to execute on leadership, you you have to 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 combine it and to make it converge with a clear vision of what you want. That the people in your teams understand what is it that you want, and also that they will see that <coughs> something will happen if you don't achieve that. You no, know? because in the end you are all fighting for the same thing, and if you don't, then you will create disenchantment with uh, with everybody. So. In, 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 at least in the, in the experience that I would like to say is about that commitment to that particular sort of vision on, on when, when you have many people, and, and by this, by commitment, I do not say that when you're fighting for achieving something is that you commit to fighting windmills, no? like, like Don Quixote, uh, because, because that is going to be, that's going to be a losing vision. But when, when you think that that vision can, can get you to, to a, a specific place, you will face a lot of resistance, a lot of inertia, 
uh, in opposing you and, and, and whatever you believe you try to do. If you believe that your vision is right, that you're not fighting windmills, that you will eventually get to where you want, and you stick to that vision while having the humility to listen to the people that will, are telling you that you might be wrong or not, but making your choices, because then you have to, a leader has to do strategy. Strategy is about making choices. And when you make those choices, you make <coughs> sure that you have to go there and achieve them. Because you have an accountability, you have skin on the game, you have whatever you want to call it, that will allow people to see that you have a stake in what you're trying to achieve, and that will only reinforce your, your leadership again. I mean, I'm sorry not to give a specific example, but pretty much you got my drift, I guess, no? I'll just give a quick example from my perspective. Um, you know, I think people have talked about building what you would call political capital within your organization. Um, you know, recently, with the downturn of the uh, economy, there's been a lot of my clients who've had issues, and we've had to do a lot of workouts now. You have to pick your battles with credit, with you know, other team members within the organization as to which ones are worth going after, which ones are not. So most recently, you know, one of our bigger clients um, had to do a, a refinancing material size. And it was, you know, one of my clients, and I had to use a lot of my political capital, which I've built up over five years by executing correctly and doing things right, and was able to, first of all, convince my manager to, you know, take a, take a risk and, and reinvest in this company. And then from there, you know, once I got his confidence, then I would go and, and, and talk to, to credit and try to get their confidence. But all that was possible because, you know, the prior groundwork which I had done, being responsible, being, you know, responsive, doing the right things helped me set up that political capital, which going forward I, I will need to use and, and, and cherish and, and protect in order for me to succeed in, 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 in Bank of America or in any corporation. So at this point, we, I want to make sure we have time to open up for any Q&A back and forth from the audience. I've often found that having the vision itself isn't sufficient. There is a step that normally acknowledges that there is something that the organization can't do, doesn't do, is unable to do, uh, and and if you can't both identify it and then admit that you have it, and then bring the organization to a place where they can understand that, and you can then start to transform it, assuming the vision is right. Could you could you comment some on that? Thank you. Uh, that's what I meant by, by finding windmills. Your, your vision will eventually uh, tell you that you wish to go somewhere, but maybe that getting there will not be possible because uh, you recognize your limitations, either yours, your teams, or your organizations. And that's when you have to make the difficult choices about either how to uh, connect those limitations with your abilities or to just change an alternate course. But leadership by itself is not telling people, you know, let's jump on the ship because this is what we want. Uh, leadership, I, I guess, in that sense, or in the, in the context of your question, to me would be uh, telling people we <coughs> were facing the cliff, but we're not just going to risk it all because the cliff is there and the vision is to get to the other side. Then your vision has to change to admit uh, externalities to come into play to help you achieve that vision, or at least to change or reorient that vision in terms of your current capabilities. Because again, vision is not enough, but at least it can give you a way or a path on to what needs to happen and to see whether you can make it happen or not. If not, then you need to choose eventually to change your vision. I don't know if I... If I, I yes. Again, depending on how good your vision is, exactly. if you... If you uh, if you compromise that too much, if you, if you, if in fact you, you need to find other capabilities to get there, again, what I've seen with leaders is sometimes that 
they, they make that assessment, and then they end up where you just said, which is, I don't think I can get there. And uh, really, they should have. Uh, right. But they didn't, you know, they either, either didn't make the assessment of what they needed to have to get there, or they didn't have the, the courage or the ability to bring the organization to a place where they didn't think they were jumping off a cliff. They thought they were really going to do something that was going to change the destiny of what they had and make it a lot better. And it's that challenge, I think, which I find important. Yeah, I, I remember, um, and it's maybe not completely answer the, the specific situation you're describing, but you know, under our leader then, Dr. Jansen, there was clearly a commercial point of view way back in the 80s that hypertension was the biggest area and we needed to do, develop, be one of the first most effective antihypertensive agents in the world. But then the question is, one, do we have the capability, do we have the expertise, even though it's a highly desirable state? And I think the feeling of Dr. Jansen was, we're not sure, but we do know we have skills in certain other areas. And if there is a product which comes out of those skills, as a result of you know, translating those skills into something tangible, we'll go ahead with it. If it happens to be in hypertension, all the better. If not, we'll take whatever kind of success we can. And the result is we developed the leadership in the whole anti-mycology -myc uh, area, which is the fungal area. And those days was looked upon as a very, 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 very limited area, su subject to you know incidents in tropical, in the tropical uh, disease segment. So very much not a very attractive, financially lucrative segment. But nobody could have told that day that 20 years later, as the uh, world becomes a village. All these tropical diseases are just as uh, uh, visible in some of northern Europe as in sub-Saharan Africa because of the whole world becoming a village. And suddenly what became a, was a very small, defined financial segment became a much more attractive segment. So it was really a question of how do you adjust the vision based on your capabilities and develop a, you know, uh, uh, um, a capability that is probably just as attractive as something you would like to have developed. So, you know, it was probably more, in, you know, accidental than, than you know, but it was based on your capability sets. And more, you may correct me if I'm wrong on this, but there was, I think in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a book and one of the researchers was in NYU, it was Will and Vision. And they were looking at uh, first movers and whether first movers ultimately dominated industries. Uh, and there was a perception that, of course, that was true. And then you looked at the dominant players, and they didn't actually happen to be first movers. And the kind of summary conclusion of the book was that what characterized those successful firms was bold vision and indomitable will. Uh, and what was interesting is that between bold vision and indomitable will was clear problem solving, uh, gathering of useful data, and assessing it realistically. Uh, but I, I think it is. Uh, you know, to set out a bold vision and a realistic vision uh, doesn't mean it's obvious you'll attain it. For example, choosing a different technology in a, a global marketplace. But, but the leader question is how well do you adapt and how strong is your will? And, and to some extent, as that literature said, is it indomitable? Uh, that's where it really hits the road because generally speaking, uh, when it starts to get tough, you know, it is quite easy to fold or to move on to something else or to let it uh, fall apart. In the financial industry, by the way, when I started out as a market maker, the best way to advance your career was actually have a giant blowout on your desk. Uh, because then the next firm would say, well, gosh, they lost so much money, that's, they must really know something now. Uh, I, I never thought that was a good model, actually, but that, that sparked that thought, too. Yeah, I think. Uh you got to be careful that the vision isn't a dream, right? And um, w w one thing that we, we kind of practice in, in our uh, company is we call it a picture of success. So you got to have the, the vision of where you're trying to go. But then, you know, much like an impressionistic painting, you, you won't see every little defined detail, but you'll be able to see enough ingredients that it holds together and you can see the, the, the end result. 
And that's where you know, you've got to spend some time uh, doing your homework, uh, and also pushing and prodding and cajoling and persuading. And if you do that well and you get all of these things around that basic vision and, and you can see the whole, you know, th then you go for it. And I think um, you know, we find that it, it works. There is a common saying in business that uh, as a leader you have not uh, excelled until your successor is successful. And uh, if you look at a lot of uh, leaders today who have been very successful in their tenure, they haven't necessarily been very good at developing their successor. Why, in, in a world where the development of talent is going to be very important, a lot of people who say that the companies that do that well are the ones that will excel, why do you think uh, that has continued to happen? What would be some of the experiences that you have had that would say that you mitigate uh, the possibility of that happening? <clears throat> One perspective on that. Um, I think, certainly in the United States, we've had a, a propensity for Hollywood star leaders. You know, I don't know whether it's Jack Welch or, or whatever. Um, and then that kind of consumes everything. And I think, uh, you know, actually in this case, I think he probably did a pretty decent job in, in building succession. But in other companies, you find that it is like General Motors, I, I know for, for a fact. Um, so it gets back a little bit to you know, you, you've got to pay your dues, you've got to be humble. If, you, if, you, if you're seeking the limelight as a leader, that's a, that's a, you know, a, a warning sign. Not only internally, but for the board members and so on. Um, and that, I think, would sometimes gets in the way of looking at what are you leaving behind, how are you building, you know, what kind of future you're leaving you know, for the company. Um, and, and the industry uh, around you. So, you know, it's, it's a tough question. It's done decently in certain places. I think the, the underlying principle is around, you know, you, you're, you're, you've got a job, but it's, it's a temp job. And, you know, you've got to suit up somebody, some group of people who can carry on and then maybe take it to the next level. That's, that's a huge part of leadership. Yeah, I'll let you have a shot. I think, uh, Banoj, I think you pretty quickly see in certain leaders, are they talking about the me or are they talking about the we? And I think that's where you know, it all stands and falls. Uh, and I, you know, you do see that uh, in a lot of, it does happen, it probably happen 40 years later, you have the same kind of situation where you have a very charismatic leader and doesn't build up his or her team sufficiently so that when the, they ride against the proverbial beer truck, there is a vacuum in the leadership. And I think it's uh, in, any, in any structure, in any organization, it behooves the, whether it's the board or, or the, the stakeholders to ensure that that continuity is maintained in a way because the organization is much larger than the leader. It's much more sustainable. Leaders come and go, but hopefully organizations go on forever. So I think it's very, very important to see within the psyche of the leader, what kind of person is that person? Are they developing the right kind of talent? Should something happen? Because nobody can say with any security, I'll be here tomorrow. Uh, people who actually took the game here will remember. One of the interesting things at Morgan, when I got there, uh, I worked on the trading side. I was a market maker. And one of the things we would do when we were training people to step onto the desks, we had a computer simulation game called Managing the Global Economy. And basically, you play, play enough sequences of this game, you could figure out what the variables were, how to manage global economy. And basically, you were a central banker is what it boiled down to. Uh, at the end of the game, though, when you had one last move, if you had figured the game out well and you weren't kind of at the top, you could actually change your uh, management of certain key variables, fiscal variables, so that you would dominate and win the game and then pass basically this giant bomb onto whoever would next be the, uh, the central banker. So you could maximize your score and destroy the world thereafter. 
And we, we actually used this to determine who we wouldn't put on a trading desk. Huh. Anyone that ever did the blowout strategy never stepped foot on a Morgan desk uh, because they revealed something very quickly about their commitment to the longer term. Uh, so, you know, you're absolutely right. You, you have to deal with that issue. And one of the questions Lori asked us was to think about differences in leaders across generations. Uh, and it's also differences in leaders across culture. Uh, and, you know, the, the issue of a sound leader being humble and thinking about the longer term for everyone behind them, that is, I, I think effective leaders in all generations have comparable traits. Uh, leaders in different generations don't. And many leaders that seem to be leaders today, you know, I think in the kind of annals of history won't be regarded as very effective because precisely that, they maximize their own publicity, they maximize their own compensation. They didn't leave their organizations and particularly the people in them well positioned for going forward. And it's a, that's a huge way actually to differentiate someone you want to turn over leadership ability to. You know, the person that was gonna blow up the world was not, they were brilliant, they were skilled, they were clever, and you'd never want them running your organization. Two words I didn't hear, I haven't heard so far, but surprised me a bit. One is situational leadership. There's, there's almost an assumption there that, you know, these are good characteristics and you need under every situation. For example, a fire or fire prevention certainly requires two very different kinds of leaders. The other is decisiveness. That is, decisiveness at times, part of leadership is being able to convince everybody you're right, and if they think you are, you are. And neither one of those came up. I'd just like some comments. Yeah. No, I, I'm a firm believer, and maybe I didn't articulate it very clearly. I'll take the first part, I'll give the second part to somebody else. What you mentioned, situational leadership, and I, I think I said earlier on in my introduction, I said it's a completely different kind of leader in a situation where you're trying to develop, let's say, a new therapy for cancer versus the kind of leader that you're going to need to build a new operational uh, factory in. Fort Washington, and I, you know, I, and I find that extremely important, the point that you bring up, because it's a different set of skills. It could be the same person, but it's going to require a different set of skills in one situation, which is completely different than the set of skills you would apply in another situation. I think your second question was? Decisiveness. Decisiveness, Decisiveness. anyone? I can take a quick stab. I mean, in, in the capital markets this area, I mean, you, you need to take a view on a company, whether or not you're, um, you know, you, you value the, the company long term. Therefore, you make an investment, or you get the investors to buy into that um, into the company story. So you do have to decide that you've got to make a decision. Take look at the risks, look at the rewards. You may or may not be right, but you know ultimately, you know you have to make your decision. If you believe you're right, you have to be decisive and convince everybody else to be decisive. Again, whether it's credit in your own bank, whether it's other investors, whether it's um, you know your 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 own team, um, so that is a very very important part for my role is being making a decision and moving forward with it and convincing others that my view is the right view and get them to come on board. So yeah, I think that's a very important point. I I believe we can uh, have a complete bottle of whiskey tonight. Thinking about decisiveness uh, because it's a it's a it's a tough subject. Um, when you talk about situational leadership and decisiveness, I, I believe you're talking about both of them within the same context of a specific situation, or if you're talking about them separately. 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 Okay. So if it's if it's if it's process decisiveness, like you would do on a trading desk or places where you have to make calls pretty much every minute or every hour or every day. Uh, that's a different set of decisiveness than when you are on a situational uh, leadership uh, you know, uh, event. And the way that I would describe decisiveness has to be putting everything into the same uh, pot, mixing it, and just making a call. And that call will have to be uh, dependent on your vision, on your level of risk, on your, the ability of your gut to uh, you know, to, to stand for what you choose to do. Uh, because basically you hear and you read many, many stories of uh, people being great leaders because they, because they made the right choice. I personally, my gut feeling is that uh, empirically as well, 
is that many of those calls or many of those judgment calls were just write out bets. And they just said, you know, this is the way that I can deal with it. I make this call and they were lucky. But for so many stories that we hear about people getting lucky, we don't not hear about many people not getting lucky with that sort of decisiveness in specific situations of leadership. No? That's that's what I at least what I've seen. Maybe I might read it wrong. <coughs> I think uh, the word decisiveness um, has a different connotation depending upon the business and the industry you're in. I think you know, clearly if, you know, if you're in the military, it has a very clear connotation. You, know, you have limited time, you have certain things you've got to deal with, and you, you make a call, and, and that's how it goes. I think in, in business, especially in, in, in uh, you know, my experience, where you've got long lead times, it's complicated things, um, you know, it's kind of not the end of the world. I, I think the dimension of persuasiveness is more important than decisiveness. I mean, you, you set a direction and, and you, you head towards it, but then you, you take the time to align as much as you can and enough to have a critical mass and head, head towards it. Kind of ties into what you just talked about. I think it was Maggie Thatcher that uh, says the story is the antithesis of uh, leadership. What did you call it? Ties into some point. So the, the comment was that Margaret Thatcher had said at one point that consensus was the antithesis of consensus building was the antithesis of leadership. Consensus building was the antithesis of leadership. And the question is, how would you talk about that? I'll take a stab at that. It, the, the question was, if she said consensusness, consensus building is the antithesis of leadership, right? Well, if, if you're talking about uh, the kind of Weasley political maneuvering that many managers engage in, in order to cement their position and never be found out, I completely agree. Um, I have a friend who gave me, he was not a CMU professor, but he gave me uh, his, co his career advice, never be on any list, good or bad. S someone who's constantly engaging in kind of testing the waters, uh, you know, reacting to others' views, trying to get a consensus so that they're never found out and therefore never on the list for good or bad and therefore terminated. Um, yeah, I agree with her completely. Having said that, though, a, a, a leader who doesn't look back, who doesn't engage with the followers and bring them to a position of common understanding, even if they don't agree fully, but such that they're persuaded to follow, if consensus building is that act of clarifying, uh, discussing, and bringing to the point where they may not completely agree, they may not see what you're saying. The leader probably has a wider, broader, different perspective. But you know, consensus building in the sense that you're persuading them and bringing them to position of saying, yes, I will follow, then I, I disagree with her. I think it's a very important thing. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, there's no question in my mind. It's, it's how you, you interpret it. If consensus building is reaching a compromise, we all know the story about trying to build a fast horse and ending up with a slow camel. So, you know, there's no question in my mind, you know, that's uh, the wrong way to go. But on the other hand, if there isn't alignment as to what that end state is going to be, much, but having had that dialogue, having had that debate, agree to disagree, but at the end of the day, someone has taken a decision and is going to lead, then it's clear that we've got to have alignment because otherwise that the future state is never going to be sustainable and it's going to probably get undone sooner than later. And she has her majesty's forces behind her, no? <laughs> <laughs> well, then what I want to thank the panel for joining us today. Well, we thank you. We wanted to, uh, again, appreciate our panelists coming uh, to reunion and sharing their insights with you. Uh, thank you, thank you. This afternoon, we thought you might need a little tea or a little coffee uh, this afternoon, so 
right after this session, we have uh, a temper tea back in the Posner Center. There'll be uh, hot beverages and sweet things for you to eat and uh, give you a chance to interact with our faculty who are going to be there. So look forward to seeing you there and having a chance to meet not only our panelists, but our faculty members as well. And then tonight, 6 o'clock, don't forget dinner, 6 o'clock at the Carnegie Museum of History of uh, Pittsburgh, the Music Hall Foyer. Thank you.